Reaching out to policymakers is not necessarily easy or natural for scholars. To be really effective in policy outreach, we actually have to unlearn some of the things that have become second nature to us as academics. Basically, we're trained to make technically detailed presentations to expert audiences who are inherently interested in our findings and who may be liable to challenge them. That training instinctively leads us astray when we talk to policy audiences. Even though I've worked in government three different times during my academic career, I still have to remind myself of what not to do every time I get on a plane to Washington. This video presents our top 10 list of common mistakes that academics make when talking to policy audiences and how to avoid them. So the most common mistake academics make is talking too much about how they did the research and too little about what it means for policy. When we're presenting our work to other scientists, we have to provide intricate details of how a study was carried out. And policymakers, by contrast, will generally trust that your research was done well. They can't and they don't want to do peer review, so don't ask them to do it. Instead, they want the so what of your findings. What does all the science that we've done actually add up to? A related mistake is saving your conclusion for the end. In any presentation to a policy audience, it's a good idea to put your bottom line up front. Summarize your recommendations for policymakers in the first 30 seconds. Otherwise, they may tune out and they may never tune back in. Third is too much information. When dealing with the policy community, you need to boil things down. Condense your findings and recommendations down to a single page at most. That's the only format in which they will move up the decision-making chain. Ideally, you'd like to leave your audience with a soundbite that captures your main point. And it's better for you to do the boiling down than to hope a staffer will do it for you. They're more likely to pass along your recommendations if they don't have to spend additional time working on it, and they're liable to get it wrong if they have to boil it down themselves. Another common mistake we see is using academic jargon. There's a lot of technical lingo in science. Some of this is unavoidable. But many of the terms that scientists use are unnecessarily abstruse or have a different meaning than they do in ordinary parlance. Overly technical phrasings can obfuscate rather than elucidate your conclusions. Make sure that you clearly articulate your salient points in terms that are comprehensible to your audience. Here's one example. Eight, and here is the anomaly at 1700. Enough with this anomaly horseshit. What is this thing? It's an asteroid, sir. How big are we talking? Sir, our best estimate is 97.6 billion. It's the size of Texas, Mr. President. Number five, preaching to the choir. One common error is to look for people in government who are most accessible or most congenial with your way of thinking, rather than the people who are most pivotal on a particular issue. When it comes to climate change, for instance, many academics tend to preach to the choir. But if the choir has no power, why bother? Instead, as we'll discuss elsewhere, focus on the people who are both influential and persuadable. Number six is starting without a strategy. At the beginning of any outreach effort, think through the impact you want to have, then work backwards from there. In other words, be strategic. Imagine that a professor wanted to persuade an agency to adopt a new way of measuring a toxin. There are a lot of different ways to start that outreach effort, but some are less likely than others to have the desired effect. For instance, that professor might consider writing an op-ed explaining why the measure that he came up with is so much better than the one the agency is currently using. But is an op-ed the best way to change the agency's behavior? Could it even have the opposite effect from what was intended by inadvertently embarrassing the official whose consent is needed to change the policy? Number seven, choosing an unpersuasive frame. Not all policymakers will be persuaded by the same arguments, but they might still agree on the same policy. Choose the argument that will persuade them, even if it's not the one that would persuade you. For example, a researcher might believe that the government should promote the development of new generation nuclear reactors. He might frame this recommendation in terms of how expanding nuclear power is necessary to help reduce carbon emissions. But this framing won't work for climate change skeptics. But that group might be persuaded by an argument that other countries are already developing these new generation nuclear technologies, and American industry is losing a major opportunity to compete. Number eight, not having a clear ask. Policymakers are constantly being asked to take or not take specific actions. If you don't make an explicit request of them, policymakers will assume that there isn't one. If you make an ambiguous or vague request, they won't know what to do. 
The closer you can get to articulating what you would like them to do right after they walk out of the meeting, the more effective you'll be. Mistake number nine is thinking that communication is just one way or one time. Your meetings with policymakers are an opportunity to share distilled information and to make an ask, but they are also an opportunity to listen. In most cases, the best results will come from building relationships with people in the policy community who can then reach out to you when they have questions. As we discuss in other videos, policy windows that are closed now will eventually open up. If you are already in contact with these relevant policymakers, you will be able to get your idea through when the time is ripe. Number 10, moving at academic cycle times. Once you've formed a relationship with a policymaker, you need to be able to respond at their pace, not an academic pace. You can't wait to return a call until after you've taught your last class for the week or until you finish up a section of the article you're working on. The reality is that the article will still be there, but the opportunity to engage with the policymaker will not. Well, that's our top 10 list. Avoiding these mistakes sounds easy in theory, but in practice it can be hard. How do you identify the right stakeholders? How will you build relationships? Well, what's the best way to develop your pitch? We cover all of those things in other videos.